Section 12 of Astounding Stories 11, November 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roxanne Weber, R O X A N N E W E B E R dot com. Astounding Stories 11, November 1930, by Various. Story, The Gray Plague, Chapter 1. The Gray Plague, by L. A. Eschbach. Side note, maimed and captive in the depths of an interplanetary meteor craft lay the only possible savior of plague-ridden Earth. Chapter 1. Five months before the beginning of that period of madness, that time of chaos and death that became known as the Gray Plague, the first of the strange meteors fell to Earth. It landed a few miles west of El Paso, Texas, on the morning of March 11th. In a few hours, a great throng of people gathered around the dully smoldering mass of fire-pitted rock, the upper half of which protruded from the earth, where it had buried itself like a huge, roughly outlined hemisphere. And then, when the crowd had assumed its greatest proportions, the meteor, with a mighty, earth-shaking roar, exploded. A vast flood of radiance, more brilliant than the light of the sun, lit up the sky for miles around. One moment, a throng of curious people, a number of scientists, newspaper men, a crashing explosion, and then a great yawning pit sending forth a blinding radiance. Destruction and death where life had been. The brilliant light streamed from the pit for about ten minutes. Then, like a snuffed-out candle flame, it vanished. The second of the strange meteors landed on the evening of March 13 in the city of Peking, China. It demolished several buildings and buried itself beneath the ruins. The Chinese, unaware of the tragedy at El Paso, gathered in the vicinity, and when the meteor exploded at about 10 o'clock that night, were instantly destroyed. As in Texas, the great pit emitted a cloud of dazzling light for about ten minutes, throwing a brilliant glow over the city and its surroundings, then was extinguished. The people of the world awoke to the fact that events worthy of more than passing interest were occurring. The press of every nation began giving the strange meteors more and more publicity. Statements of different pseudoscientists were published in explanation of the meteor's origin, statements that aroused worldwide conjecture. Approximately 24 hours after the falling of the second missile, the third one fell, landing near Madrid, Spain. The Spaniards, having received news of the El Paso and Peking tragedies, avoided the ugly mass of rock as though it were a dreaded pestilence. In every way, its action was similar to that of its two predecessors. The interest of the world was doubled now. The unusual similarity of the action of the meteors and the regularity of their landings seemed indicative of a definite, hostile purpose behind it all. A menace from the unknown, a peril from the skies. Scientists began giving serious consideration to the unusual phenomena, pottering around in the pits, wearing airs of puzzlement. But their investigations were of no avail, for nothing of any great significance came to light through their efforts. At about that time, an announcement was made that created a furor. Astronomers in different parts of the United States reported that they had observed a bright flare of light leaping up from the darkened portion of the planet Venus. The astronomers had no definite idea of anything of importance in back of what they had seen, but not so the masses. The flare, they said, was caused by the release of another meteor. From Venus? Missiles, hurled by Venerians, menacing the Earth? The silver planet became the subject of universal discussion. Innumerable fantastic articles about it appeared in magazine sections of Sunday newspapers, and the astronomers of Earth turned their telescopes toward Venus with an interest they had never felt before. Four days of expectant waiting passed by after the third meteor had fallen, while interest continued mounting at an accelerating pace. And then, at about two o'clock in the morning of the 18th, 
three great observatories, two in North America and one in England, recorded the falling of an extraordinarily large and unusually brilliant meteor that glowed with an intense bluish-white light as it entered the Earth's atmosphere. And, unlike most meteors, this one was not consumed by its intense heat, but continued gleaming brilliantly until it vanished below the horizon. Simultaneous with the falling of the meteor, the Earth was rocked by one of the worst quakes in history. Seismographs in all parts of the world recorded the tremors of the Earth, each indicating that the disturbance had occurred somewhere beneath the Atlantic Ocean. Evidently, the fourth meteor had fallen into the ocean, for the shaking of the Earth was obviously the result of the collision. That quakes had not followed the landing of the first three was due to the fact that they had been far smaller than the fourth. And then, a short time after the earthquake, the worst storm in 200 years broke over the Atlantic. Waves mountain high piled themselves upon each other in a wild frenzy. A shrieking wind lashed the waters into a liquid chaos. Great ocean liners were tossed about like tiny chips. An appalling number of smaller ships were lost in the insane storm. Nor was the destruction confined to the sea. For all along the Atlantic coast of North America and Europe, mighty walls of water rushed in and wrecked entire towns and cities. Fortunately, the storm was of short duration. A few hours after it began, it subsided. For a number of weeks, public attention was centered upon the meteors and storm. But gradually, when nothing further occurred, the fickle interest of the masses began to wane. A month after the storm, the strange meteors were no longer mentioned by the press and consequently had passed from the public mind. Only the astronomers remembered, keeping their telescopes trained on Venus night after night. Four months passed by during which nothing of an unusual nature came to the attention of the world. But at the end of that time, it suddenly dawned upon those nations whose shores touched the Atlantic Ocean that something extraordinary was happening. It was taking place so insidiously, so quietly, that it had attracted no great attention. A series of inexplicable sea disasters had begun. Every ship that had traveled over a certain regular steamship route had disappeared, leaving no trace. Mysteriously, without warning, they had vanished. Without a single SOS being sent, seven freighters had been lost. The disappearances had been called to the world's attention by the shipping companies, alarmed at the gradual loss of their boats. Then other mysterious vanishings came to the attention of the world. Ships in all parts of the Atlantic were being lost. When this fact became known, transatlantic commerce ceased almost overnight. With the exception of a few privately owned yachts and freighters, the Atlantic became deserted. And finally, a few days after the world became aware of the strange disappearances on the Atlantic, the Gray Plague introduced itself to humanity. Attempts were made to repress the facts, but the tragedy of the freighter Charleston, in all its ghastliness and horror, became known in spite of all attempts at secrecy. On the morning of August 3rd, the Charleston was found, half buried in the sand of a beach on the coast of Florida, cast there evidently by a passing storm. The freighter had been one of the first boats to disappear. When the ship's discoverers boarded her, their eyes were greeted by a sight whose ghastliness filled them with a numbing horror. Indeed, so terrifying was the spectacle on the Charleston that the discoverers, four boys of adolescent age, left in fear-stricken haste, nor could they be induced to return to the ship's deck. Later, a group of men from a nearby town boarded the freighter to investigate the boys' amazing report. In the group was a newspaper reporter who chanced to be in the vicinity on a minor story. It was through the reporter's account that the facts became known as quickly as they did. When the men clambered up the side of the Charleston to her deck, they saw a spectacle the like of which had never before been seen on earth. Although they had been prepared for the horror to some extent by the story of the boys, the sight on the Charleston exceeded their description to such a degree that, for a moment, the men were rendered speechless. The deck of the Charleston was a shambles, a scene of sudden, chilling death. 
all about were strewn gray, lifeless bodies. Death had overtaken the crew in the midst of their duties, suddenly, without warning, it seemed. Bodies strewn about, yet nowhere was there sign of decay. Bodies lifeless for days or weeks, yet intact. The men were fearfully impressed by the strangely grotesque positions of the corpses. With a few exceptions, they lay on the deck in abnormal, twisted masses of gray-covered flesh. Somehow they seemed flattened, as though they had been soft, jelly-like, and had flowed, had settled, flat against the deck. Some were no more than three inches thick, and had spread out to such an extent that they looked like fantastic caricatures of human bodies. That unnatural change in their structure, and the ghastly, death-gray color of their skins, gave the corpses a horrifying, utterly repulsive appearance that made the flesh of the men crawl. The bodies had a strangely soft aspect, as though they were still jelly-like. One of the men, bolder than the rest, touched a body and withdrew his hand in revulsion and surprise. For the ugly mass was cold and as hard as bone, the tissues of the flesh seemingly replaced by a solid, bony substance. Later investigation revealed that all the dead on the Charleston had assumed a similar bone-like solidity. When the men left the freighter to report the tragedy to the proper authorities, their faces were blanched and their nerves badly shaken. Yet their horror was nothing when compared with what it would have been had they known what was to follow. Rapidly, the story of the Charleston spread. By means of the press, over the radio, even by word of mouth, the story of the horror on the freighter was given publicity. All over the United States and Canada it spread, and from thence to the rest of the world. Eagerly was the story accepted. Here, at last, was the explanation of the sea disasters, and then, more than ever before, was the Atlantic Ocean shunned. The bodies of the seamen on the freighter were turned over to scientists for experimentation and research. It was thought that they might be able to discover the cause of the Grey Death, and with a knowledge of its cause, create something with which to free the Atlantic from its scourge. The scientists' investigations only served to mystify the world to a greater degree. The only thing that came to light was the cause of the body's bone-like rigidity. In some inexplicable way, the bones in the semen had dissolved, and according to appearances, while the bodies were plastic, had flattened out. And then, strange and unnatural though it seemed, the calcium from the dissolved bones had gathered at the surface of each body and combining with the flesh and skin had formed the hard, bony shell that gave them their ghastly grayness and their appearance of petrification. Aside from this, the scientists learned nothing. The cause of this amazing phenomena was a complete mystery to them. Slowly, methodically, step by step, the unusual had been taking place. From the time of the landing of the first strange meteor up to the discovery of the Charleston, there had been a gradual increase in the significance of each succeeding event. Then, finally, came the climax, the Grey Plague itself. All that preceded it faded into significance before the horror of the dread pestilence that seized the world with its destroying talons. A short time after the discovery of the Charleston, the plague made its first appearance on land. Slowly, pitilessly, inexorably, it began taking its toll all along the Atlantic coast. From Newfoundland to Brazil, from the British Isles to Egypt, wherever people lived near the ocean, thousands were stricken with the dread malady. The old and infirm were the most quickly affected. Their weakened bodies could not withstand the ravage of the plague, as could those of younger people. An old man, walking along a large thoroughfare in Savannah, Georgia, suddenly uttered a fearful shriek and sank to the pavement. While the pedestrians watched with bulging eyes, he seemed to shrink, to flatten, to flow liquidly, turning a ghastly gray. Within an hour, he was as hard as the men of the Charleston. Of all the millions, perhaps he was the first. Others followed in the wake of the first victim, young as well as old. 
Three hours after the death in Savannah, every channel of communication was choked with news of a constantly increasing number of casualties. A Boston minister preaching a funeral sermon, collapsing beside the coffin, a lineman on a telegraph pole, overcome, falling, and splashing. A thousand incongruous tragedies shocking humanity. In Europe, the action of the plague was the same as in North America. Death stalking the seacoast, destroying thousands. Ignorant fishermen, men of learning, women and children of every age, all were grist to be grinded in the mill of the Grey Plague. Before a week had gone by, no one remained alive in the villages, towns, and cities all along the Atlantic. New York, London, all the large coast cities were deserted by the living, left to the rigid dead. From the largest metropolis to the smallest hamlet, all became body-glutted tombs. And then, on the morning of October 12th, news was given to the world that threw mankind into a panic. The plague was moving inland. Slowly yet relentlessly it spread, no longer confining its effects to the seacoast, but moving farther and farther inland toward the heart of the two continents, driving mankind before it. For people fled in insane terror before the advancing death, nor was there escape from the menace, no antidote to counteract, no sanctuary wherein to hide. To north and south, to east and west, the pestilence spread, destroying as it went. Unless there were some miraculous intervention, the human race would be destroyed. Officials of the world were at their wit's end. Scientists threw up their hands in despair. The plague was an insoluble puzzle, enigmatic, utterly inexplicable, beyond the knowledge of Earth. Scientists and doctors were brutally slain during that period by fear-crazed mobs because of their inability to rescue the world from the grip of the plague. Thousands of people died while striving to escape from the Great Death, crushed by passing motor vehicles or starving in the congested areas. Gone was the boasted civilization of man, humanity sinking rapidly to the level of the beast. Gone, destroyed in a few weeks. And then one day, when the end seemed perilously close, there was ushered into the presence of the remnant of the United States officials who had gathered in San Francisco, a twisted monstrosity of a man, fearfully scarred and deformed. He was closeted with them for two hours. At the end of that time, an excited official communicated with the leader of the American scientists. A cure for the plague has been discovered, he cried in joyful tones. Man still has a chance. Before an hour had passed by, scientists were in possession of cultures of germs that would destroy the bacilli of the Great Death. The hope of salvation restored some semblance of order, and in a very short time, the development of the germs was going forward as rapidly as skilled bacteriologists could carry it. Forces of doctors were marshaled to administer the cure, inoculating all who were untouched by the plague. At about that time, a small, bronze-colored sphere arose into the air above San Francisco and sped eastward with amazing velocity. It flashed over the United States, over the Atlantic Ocean, and over Western Europe, finally landing in the midst of the European hordes. There, its operator, a deformed cripple, left bacteria similar to those he had given to the United States. In a short time, Europe, too, was busily engaged in developing the bacteria and inoculating her people. Many others died before the world was rendered immune, but at last mankind let its labor cease. The Gray Plague was overcome. Then the work of reclaiming the deserted areas was begun. Then, too, was started the ghastly task of disposing of the countless rigid dead. And finally, a great steamer left New York Harbor and started across the Atlantic. It was the purpose of the men on board to destroy utterly the source of the plague. But long before that occurred, humanity had heard the story of Philip Parkinson, the man who saved the world, had heard and had honored the deliverer of mankind. Parkinson's story follows. End of Story The Gray Plague Chapter 1 Recording by Roxanne Weber R-O-X-A-N-N-E-W-E-B-E-R dot com